that was coming to an end. I had to go back out to sea on the submarine, but at that time I was married with two children. I uh, wasn't really looking forward to going back out to sea. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started asking around and they said, whatever you do, don't throw away, you know, nine years of your military time. And we um, basically had a honeymoon because it was probably a year and a half after we had gotten married. Mm -hmm. uh, but we stayed in a convent with a bunch of nuns. I turn around and I looked at the submarine and it almost felt like it was 100 miles away. Like that's when I realized how small I was, uh, where I was. Uh, so a little anxiety started setting in, but. Especially when you're thinking about this new upcoming trip. Sure. Yes. The four monther. <coughs> What? Whoa, we got to hear this. Nine months? It's not going to take nine months. Maybe. Busted. What? Hello, this is Jimbo from the YouTube channel Jimbo South Dakota, and this is the Hoghouse Chronicles podcast. And right next to me, I have Jake and Jackie Lackis, and uh, friends, uh, we're friends from the Air National Guard in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. That's right. And uh, so we're just going to roll right into uh, Jake, and you just tell us how much uh, you want about how you're raised, where you're raised, family, siblings, what have you. And Jackie, you can do the same, and then roll into how you guys met. Sure. So. <clears throat> Hello, I'm uh, Jake Lackis. I grew up in Randolph, Nebraska. Uh, son of Neil and Carolyn Lackis. I have a sister, Becky, that lives in Brandon, and a brother, Tony, that lives in Lincoln. Uh, Randolph is just in between Yankton and Norfolk. Population right now, I believe, about 800 people. Uh, and just south of Crofton, Nebraska, where Jackie grew up. So I'll let her introduce... Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jackie Lackis. Um, grew up in uh, Crofton. I have a sister who lives in Denver and another sister who lives in um, Yankton. And um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, you there you go. go. First yeah. one of those. <laughs> Crofton is just about 10 miles south of Yankton, so not far away. We're... Randolph's about an hour and a half uh, from Sioux Falls and Crofton, probably a hour, I guess. Okay, so am I hearing high school sweetheart stuff here? Or, Not or, till uh, really. How did that probably, come around? Yeah, so um, we had a lot of mutual friends in high school and um, we kind of sort of started dating towards the end of high school and then just uh, went into college. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I joined the military and she went on to college and. Yeah, that was about it. So I guess that's kind of how we met. And okay. we just decided to keep that relationship open-ended and <laughs> did long distance for a couple a of years. Yeah. Yeah. Until we were 21. Yep. <clears throat> and he <clears throat> called me on the phone <laughs> and proposed. <laughs> she she called me. That's how it was. Wow. Uh, I don't know. I think she gave me the ultimatum. She's like, this long distance thing isn't going to work, so we need to figure something out. Sure. Uh, so I knew how the military worked, and I said, well, if we got married, the government would pay for you to move here and then obviously pay for us to live together um, instead of just living together as boyfriend and girlfriend. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I did the justice of the peace thing and um, got married in 91, by the Justice of the Peace, moved out, and then uh, did the church wedding in December of 1992. My wife and I did the same thing. Very we started good. looking for an acreage, thought it was going to take us a year. Yeah. Found it in 30 days. <laughs> got married by the JP, bought the place. A year and eight days later, nice. got married in the church right down here. So, Not yeah, too far similar. Away. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as far as the, uh, the military itself, did you always have an interest in that? Or did you know the guard was around anywhere? You were down in Nebraska, so you're away from always away from here. Sure. 
Um, so my dad had been in the Navy. I had uncles and cousins um, in the Navy and then other cousins that had joined the military. Um, I kind of knew that if I had gone off to college, um, I might have struggled uh, too much, maybe less studying and more partying. So mm -hmm. I'm like, I was a little nervous about going to college. Um, so yeah, we called up the recruiter and uh, ended up joining the Navy in 1989 and did um, just about nine years. I was aboard a USS um, submarine out of Norfolk, Virginia. And then we got transferred to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and did um, security forces there, which was a lot like our security forces people on the South Dakota Air Guard Base. Um, when I was getting ready to... So in the Navy, you know how it works. You have sea duty and shore duty. So I did my sea duty, did shore duty in Hawaii. And then when I was, that was coming to an end, I had to go back out to sea on the submarine. But at that time I was married with two children. I uh, wasn't really looking forward to going back out to sea. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started asking around and they said, whatever you do, don't throw away, you know, nine years of your military time. So they said, look at the Air Guard or the Air Reserves. Well, I knew neither about either one. So anyway, ended up getting out, moving out to, to back to Nebraska with my parents. And then I called the Lincoln Air National Guard and ended up joining them for a year. Oh, okay. Um, they sent me to school in Biloxi, uh, Mississippi. And then while I was there, uh, Jackie got a job um, with a law firm in Sioux Falls. So she called me and I just figured um, no sense in being in the guard in Lincoln when uh, the, we're going to be living in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. So um, called up to South Dakota, got a hold of Dean Hilberg. He did the transfer paperwork and uh, came back from Biloxi. I thanked everybody in Lincoln and, and transferred to South Dakota. So been here since 99, probably. Mm -hmm. So Nice. Yeah, a few years. Yeah, <laughs> and... Uh... We talked to uh, Dev Phelps earlier today, yeah, yes. and so um, I don't remember if it was when the cameras were rolling, uh, but when you first came into the unit, were you working like for her or near uh, so in her it's, section? Or? Sure. It's kind of ironic because uh, currently I work in ops, and that was actually my first job. My um, I was information management working for um, <laughs> Hook. Greg Lair? Greg Lair, thank you. That's mm -hmm. embarrassing. He was my very first supervisor. Uh, and now, obviously, he's retired general. Um, but, uh, yeah, information management doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but while working uh, for General Lair, I figured that the Air Guard was a pretty good opportunity that I'd want to make it full-time. So I started asking around, and everybody said, if you want a full-time job, supply is has a lot of turnover uh, so at that time um, general lair had moved on and eric knutson was my supervisor and he said yeah i support you you know transfer over to supply so i transferred as a guardsman and then started uh, applying for jobs and got hired over in supply where deb phelps was one of my many supervisors over mm -hmm. in supply so um, i've had six different afscs since i've <laughs> been in the Air Guard, so I've moved around quite a bit. Yeah, because you were a recruiter at one time, too. I was, well. recruiter, services, um, two different jobs in uh, supply, and then ops, and then information management. So mm -hmm. a lot of different AFSCs. Did you have any reservations about the military at all, or what um, went through your head? You know, I, I was excited at 21 to get out of uh, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> And go to Virginia. So, um, yeah, it was, it afforded me some opportunities to get to see other parts of the states mm -hmm. and meet some really neat people yeah. along the way. Mm -hmm. I think one of the neatest things that happened is that one time I was in um, La Maddalena, Italy, and called Jackie and she said, Hey, a lot of the pilot, or excuse me, pilot. Officer wives are flying over to Rome and meeting their husbands. Do you think that's something I could do? And I said, absolutely. So uh, 
She flew to Rome. I caught a ferry from La Maddalena over to Naples, got on a train, went down to Rome, and we um, basically had a honeymoon because it was probably a year and a half after we had gotten married. Mm -hmm. uh, but we stayed in a convent with a bunch of nuns and then uh, got to see the Pope. And at the time, Jackie was Catholic, so that was a very big deal. Mm -hmm. Got to see the Colosseum and do a lot of sightseeing. So, yeah, that was a really neat opportunity that we had. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> you sent me a bunch of pictures, and and I uh, I made a little list here, sure, just to make sure we, that we hit on some of that stuff. So you've got some uh, pretty cool things that you've you've done military, and uh, also just with uh, uh, when you're on leave from the military as right. well. We'll touch on that stuff sure. a little bit later. So um, we've been very lucky, mm -hmm. very blessed. So yeah. So okay, I'll just do this. A uh, mechanical bull picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe that was down in Tennessee during the um, non-commissioner officers uh, training down there. Uh, so I went with uh, Eric Tiedemann, and then obviously I met a bunch of other people down there. But we went out one night, and uh, much respect for those bull riders because that stuff is not easy. <laughs> and I, I'm sure you've tried it, Jim. And it's yeah, it's a lot harder than you think. No, I've I've tried the mechanical bull. That's pretty hard on oh, the inner thighs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as full up bull riders, all I've done is announcer. I did. Okay. I announced one down Vermillion for about okay. four years or so. Yeah. Yeah. Microphone is my friend. You're right. Back there, no. It's no not bull stuff. It's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, there was also a picture that looked like you were with a bunch of friends and it was almost like a Himalayan mountain background to it with, you know, like some ethnic type hats on or something. Okay. So that would have been uh, Marcy Ryans and Larity Dibble. And um, he's not in our unit anymore, but that was during the no fly zone, north and south no fly zone. Mm -hmm. And we were flying out of Turkey to support that. Um, yeah, that was just like a two or three week deployment to Turkey. So we got a chance to go out and uh, do some sightseeing. And um, yeah, the, the lady was selling that kind of stuff. So we just put it on to get a, sure. to get a fun picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lloyd Velick was the other gentleman oh, in the picture. Yeah. Yep. I believe he's in Kansas right now, but mm -hmm. good guy. Yeah. Some of the pictures were submarine stuff. Sure. Go ahead and uh, tell us more about your, your naval career. What, what you went into as far as a job, uh, how you got into that, and then what was uh, what were some of your experiences on s ships and or subs? Yeah. Um, so everybody in the military takes the ASVAB test, and I scored fairly, fairly high. And so they kind of, you know, laid out all the jobs that um, I was qualified for, and they showed me um, ET, which was electronic technician, and they said, well, they have them on submarines now remember i'm from nebraska a town of 800 people i don't even think at that time i had seen the ocean maybe uh, let alone a submarine but i'm like i've always been the kind of per person that's not afraid to try something new mm -hmm. uh so yeah i got stationed on the uss silversides out of norfolk virginia went to submarine school in groton connecticut um that was probably about four months and then uh, immediately, as soon as re reporting to Virginia, they shipped me over to the Mediterranean where the submarine was already at. And I got aboard and um, spent four years on the submarine. Wow. Yeah. Four years. Yeah. So well, get this. <laughs> yeah. So that year in, what was it, 91? <laughs> that when we got married? Yeah. Yeah. I always get confused because. We got married twice. Twice, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. So I figured it out with a couple other wives. That first year we were married, we were together two months. Yeah. But not consecutive two months. Right. Because on a, was it a fast attack? Submarine. Yep. Yep. So yeah, six month med run. Then they're back for a, a week. Then they're out for a couple weeks. Or they're out for a month. It's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of and, coming and going. You know, I knew no one. <laughs> That's the but hard I part had to, for spouses, uh -huh. for sure. I, you know, worked at a law firm and met some really neat people. So yeah, but I, one real cool story is uh, 
I think maybe it was my last deployment or maybe mm -hmm. my second one, but um, I had the opportunity to fly home early. And there was about four of us. And so I did not call her and tell her, but we flew home and then got to, I believe, Washington, D.C. And then, um, or maybe it was Maine, but we anyway, we caught um, a flight with a bunch of high-ranking military officials down to Washington, D.C., and then we had to get a rental car to drive to Virginia. But I called her best friend, and I said, is Jackie there? And she's like, yeah, I'll let you talk to her. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm actually going to be home in like 20 minutes. You need to, and I'd been gone for six months. Mm -hmm. So I said, um, you need, whatever you're doing, you need to tell her you need to go to bed and she needs to go home. <laughs> so she sent her home and I was, um, I had got in the house and cleaned up and then I was sitting outside on the steps and she came home and saw me and thought I was some creeper, you know, and then went in the house and could tell I had been there. So yeah, that was kind of a, that was neat. Yeah, a nice homecoming because I'd been gone for six months. Right. But yeah, the submarine life is, uh, everybody doesn't think they could do it, but it's really not as bad as you think. Um, I mean, yeah, the ceilings are shorter, the, the walls are smaller, but the only difference really is is that you can't see outside. Um, you don't realize where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, you just have a job to do and you do it and and go about your business. But a lot, you know, we would come to um, periscope depth, which it was what it was called, just high enough in the water where you could see out the periscope and send the snorkel up so we could bring in fresh air and everything and send the antennas up to get uh, news and our fix so we kind of knew where we were at. Um, but for the most part, yeah, it was just day to day. Our days were 18 hour days instead of 24. So you'd like, work for six hours and then you have 12 hours off oh, wow yeah so we watched a lot of movies uh we had some workout equipment on on board but obviously very tight quarters um yeah so got to know your shipmates very well were you what they call hot bunking uh when i was younger you just you did you had to you had to do it because there's more people on board than there were uh, bunks, sure. I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, go ahead and explain what that is. <laughs> well, so hot racking, hot bunking basically means um, while you're up, somebody else is sleeping in your bunk. And then when it's time for you to go to bed, he gets up and goes to work or whatever, and now you get to sleep. Obviously, you would change out. Most people had sleeping bags or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but you always hoped that you got... Uh, somebody that had good hygiene yeah <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is right but yeah that's just how it was so mm -hmm. yeah and you did uh you did four years on there correct yeah in um uh, 93 93 um they came to us and said they were going to decommission the submarine and send us to bremerton washington so i was pretty excited about that because i've never been up to the Pacific Northwest. Um, so was looking forward to that. And then about three months before we were to leave, they said, change of plans, we're going to Pearl Harbor. So break hmm. my heart, we had to move to Hawaii for four <laughs> years. Um, but when we got to um, Pearl Harbor, uh, I was on shore duty at that time. And I, it's not necessarily that I didn't like being an electronic technician, but I wanted to try something new. So I called my recruiter, and he sent me to Lackland Air Force Base for um, security forces. And that's the first time, lo and behold, that I was on Lackland, which is an Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Kind of ironic that I would end up going there. But did security forces and got really lucky because when I got back to Pearl Harbor, they put me on a patrol boat, which basically I just drove around Pearl Harbor and checked the... Um, boats and the pier and we worked off of ford island um, where the japanese had bombed and everything mm -hmm. and the only way to access ford island at the time was to call us or the ferry to get a ride over there i think now there's probably a bridge mm -hmm. that goes over there but at the time uh, there was no bridge so you had to catch a boat um, over there so it was a very um, nice detail that i had um, while in pearl harbor what did you think about uh, Hawaii, and, and did you mm. work when you were over there? Um, 
or, you know, how, what was that experience for you? Were you able to make friends, hang out with folks, do things? Yeah, I, um, so I have a career in paralegal and law, but I decided when we went to Hawaii, I was just going to take a break from it. And so, um, I just, uh, was an assistant manager at a women's boutique in, um, Iaea, Hawaii. And so that was a nice little break. But at the time I was also expecting our first child. So, um, I did that short term and then decided to take, um, some time off and be a stay at home mom. Mm-hmm. But you, I thought, didn't you work? So you didn't do any paralegal work in Hawaii? Oh, wait. But then, yeah. then we had our first. And after a year, then I found a part time paralegal job downtown mm-hmm. Honolulu. So I did that. And then he got to be stay at home dad and got to <laughs> understand why. I wasn't getting as much accomplished in a day. He's like, I get it now. So it was the best <laughs> experience. <laughs> sure. Right? Mm-hmm. So, yes. But, yeah, Hawaii was nice. Um, the weather was always beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, always stuff to do outside. We'd call back home in December, and Mom and Dad would be out shoveling, and we'd be headed to the beach or something like that. So, uh, definitely enjoyed it. Mm. Snorkeling? Snorkeling, scuba diving, mm-hmm. um, hiking, um, bike riding, yeah, pretty much. And we had a lot of friends that would come out and stay with us. Is that where so, I saw, like, the cliff diving photo or whatever that I saw in there? So that would have been <laughs> uh, that would have been in La Maddalena, Italy, oh. um, yeah, while we were overseas. So mm-hmm. uh, just a bunch of buddies going out and trying to find stuff to do. Sure. Yeah, so just was... like jump off this big old <laughs> smooth rock. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think somebody had tested the water, so we knew it was deep enough. Right. But yeah. How high was it from the water? <clears throat> it looks pretty high in the picture, doesn't it? Yeah. We'll just go with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you should tell them the story about your swim call in oh, the Mediterranean. Well, I think you for have the a second year. Yeah, you have a couple of pictures of that. So, um. Obviously, when you're out there that long, people get pent up, and um, the captain would call swim call. So we would just surface the submarine, and um, everybody would come topside and literally just swim in the ocean. Um, But we were up there. uh, My buddy Frankie Lopez and I were um, the ship's um, Navy divers, and so we would always have to go up there first and whatever, check stuff out, and then everybody else would come up. But we were out there swimming one day, and the captain's topside, and he's like, Lacus. I see something floating out there in the water. So we look out there and no idea what it is, but he's like, get out there and get it. So I'm like, okay. And uh, I had goggles on, so I'm swimming. Now remember, we're this is literally the ocean. Right. Swimming out there and you can look down, but obviously you can't see the bottom. You can just see um, sunlight, sun rays going down and you realize like how deep this water is. But I just kept swimming and swimming, and pretty soon I get out there, and well, it was just a, a bottle floating, so I grab it. I turn around, and I looked at the submarine, and it almost felt like it was 100 miles away. Like, that's <laughs> when I realized how small I was, uh, where I was, uh, so a little anxiety started setting in, but started swimming back, got to the sub, gave it to the captain. Unfortunately, nothing was in it, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was uh, quite an experience. We had a guy... His name was Jim Monks, and uh, not even joking, this guy was like 6'7", probably over 300 pounds on the submarine. My word. Yeah, he was a big boy, but he was in the top of the sail, and he was up there with an M14 uh, on shark watch, and that should tell you (laughs) something. And so I asked him, I said, Jim, you ever going to get in the water? And he's like, Jake. When you enter the ocean, you enter the food chain. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> might be time to get out. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty neat experience to say you swam out there. So how long was that sub? How many people were in the thing? Sure. Did you have to shift out on the on the swimming? Uh, well, yeah, because there was, we it, obviously it was a nuclear sub, so the reactor never shut down. So you always had people mm-hmm. uh, on watch for that. Um I believe the sub was 360 feet long, and uh, 
we probably averaged like 110 people. Uh, occasionally, we'd get Navy SEALs on board, and then we would just put uh, two by four planks down in the torpedo room, and they would have to sleep on those. Uh, that was a different experience, but we were a stretch hall, so we were a little bit longer than a normal uh, 637 class submarine. But um, yeah, they're a lot bigger than you um, think they are. I think I sent you a picture when we're in dry dock. Yeah. When we actually took it out of the water in Charleston, South Carolina, and it's kind of like an iceberg. You only see 10%. So every, there's a lot underneath the water. Right. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add. Sure. So when we um, got our marriage blessed in the Catholic Church. Yes. He, so, you know, mind you, there's no cell phones. How do we communicate, right? Mm -hmm. So if you miss that phone call, you get the answering machine and you save that message, oh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, one time he calls and he's like, well, don't be upset, but I won't have a ring to wear oh. or for you to give me at the wedding. <laughs> That's what you were. That's what I was getting gotcha. at. So Tell during stories. But. Yeah, during the <laughs> swim call um, in the ocean, there's a lot of swells. You know, up, so we were kind of playing king of the mountain. Like you catch the swell, try to grab the top of the submarine and hang on and then get on top. Well, I caught it and then the swell dropped out from underneath me, but my ring was caught on something on the sub. Oh, no. And I had probably only been married. It was our first year. Yeah. And boom. So the ring's in the bottom of the ocean. Luckily, not with your finger. No, that's right. I, you know, I know all kinds of farmers that yes. you know, don't have that. Right. <laughs> but that's the second one I've lost. Wow. So that was the first one, but now I've lost two. Actually, three. I know. <laughs> Might be a sign. I don't know, Jim. <laughs> Henceforth, he... Yeah, no, no rings. No more. I can't do it. Yeah, I've never been a been a fan of rings, um, but I noticed, you know, through like the last 15, 18 years or whatever, a lot of the guys are wearing like, I think it's a rubber rubber ring, yes. You know, fairly yes. wide and stuff. Yep, you see a lot more of those. Mm -hmm. Did I see a hang glider picture? So that you gave? something was like careening over the edge of this deal, mm -hmm. and I was zooming in on the photo trying to see exactly mm -hmm. what that was. So that was not, or I was not the hang glider. Excuse me, that was my friend Mike Benson, who was a um, Pearl Harbor police officer. We were launching him off of a cliff over Magnum PI's house. house. Oh, really? <laughs> um, but it's it's kind of hard to tell in the picture, but literally it's just a piece of wood hanging over a cliff that I'm standing on. And then I have to, um, whatever he's hanging on to, I have to hold on to. And when he says one, two, three, I launch him over my head and pray that he doesn't kick me in the head. But I had a rope around me just in case something were to happen that was tied to the cliff uh, but yeah he just um, flew over the top of my head and launched off the cliff so wow yeah he he um at one time had a license where he could take somebody with him but i believe at that time it had expired or something so would you have done it i don't know that was uh <laughs> probably yeah. Uh, yeah. Knowing you, you're pretty adventurous. <laughs> yeah. We're going to get some of that later. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, that was pretty neat to watch him go off of there. <laughs> yeah. There's a few of these pictures I was looking at. There's another one where it's in the distance and it just looks like a craggy peak and looks like there's a couple people sitting up there a little ways in. Hmm. Oh. That wasn't like the Rock of Gibraltar, was it? I'm I'm not sure. Maybe there wasn't any people on it. Mm. Probably just looking at a peak from the distance. Yeah, I don't remember that one. I I mean, we were on the Rock of Gibraltar where we got pictures, but um, there's I don't think that we had any people over there. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but you were a certified scuba diver. Yeah, for the for the Navy. So you said you had you and one other guy were. Navy divers. Navy divers, that's the term you right. use. So, so what did that all entail? Uh, so my buddy, Frankie Lopez, he just, um, one day he's on the submarine, he's like, hey, this sounds neat, you, let's do it. I'm like, all right, I ain't got nothing going on. So got permission from our supervisors, and they sent us down to Panama City, Florida for uh, Navy dive school. 
which unfortunately unfor was during spring break, so we didn't have any fun at all. <laughs> um, this would have been 1992. Uh, it was probably a six-week school down there. Jackie surprised me and came down from Virginia and probably spent four days or something. Nice. Mm. Had a um, check up on him. Sure. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's spring probably, break. Yeah. Probably smart. <laughs> uh, no, but um, so basically our job was to um, dive the submarine when we pulled into port and then dive when we left uh, to just make sure nothing had been attached to the sub or anything like that. But probably a few of the best experiences or scariest experiences, I guess, is uh, <clears throat> so in Greece – we weren't allowed to pull into port. They didn't have the setup to support us. So we had to anchor out in the harbor. Um, so we got to sub, we got to scuba dive underneath the submarine and like literally lay on our backs and you could see the entire submarine Man. while you're laying there in this, I mean, imagine the Mediterranean water is just crystal blue and to see that. So that was really neat. And then um, another time, so on top of the, the mast, the snorkel and the periscope and all of that, they have what they call um, um, a big block, like an ice block. So when we went like to the North Pole or something, it would protect them. Mm -hmm. And But they were covered in plastic and, and rubber, excuse me, and rubber. But after a while, that stuff would wear off. So they would have to take that. And it was like imagine a toilet bowl, I guess, on top of a periscope. Uh, very heavy and very big, but they would have to take that off. Well, they were doing that one day in Virginia in the port, and they dropped it into the water. Uh, so my buddy Frankie had gone home, so I was the only one left, and so they made me suit up and then dive in the in the Virginia Bay. And I don't. It's kind of like the Missouri River. You get down about a foot, and you can't see your hand. Right. Right. And um, so I get down there, and there's probably a thousand coffee cups from. The guys stand and watch because they'd throw them at each other at night. <laughs> I think I found a popcorn machine down there. The pilots will appreciate that. Yeah. But it's just muddy water. But lo and behold, I ended up finding the thing and uh, getting it topside. And, um, but yeah, it was cold. And then um, I guess one other time I worked, when I got out of the Navy, I worked for the South Dakota Game Fishing Parks down in Yankton. And me and my buddy were having lunch, and we got a call that a boat was sinking. So we raced out there, and the boat was already gone. It had sunk in the Missouri River, kind of in between South Dakota and Nebraska. But all of a sudden, my buddy's like, well, weren't you a diver? And I'm like, well, yeah. And he's like, well, I think the boss has some <laughs> dive gear. I'm like, well, it's been a couple years. Anyway, we got the dive gear, and they tied a rope to me. Uh, gave me a rope to tie to the boat and then gave me another rope to pull on when I found it. So I went down in the Missouri River and same thing as Virginia, you can't see anything. I don't even know if I had a mask on because it doesn't do any good to see because you just can't. But I got down there, followed, <clears throat> so the, the guys had been skiing, so the ski rope was floating. So I just followed the ski rope down knowing that I would find the boat, right? Right. So I follow the ski rope down, and all of a sudden I'm standing in mud, but there's no boat. But I got the ski rope. Well, what had happened is the motor is heavier, so the motor sunk into the mud. So I'm at the bottom where the motor is, and the boat is on top of my head floating. Oh, wow. And I did not realize that. Mm -hmm. I started feeling, and I'm like, oh, my God, the boat's on top of me. So that kind of freaked me out, but I followed it up to the bow hook at the front, ran the uh, rope through it, and it went top or got back up, and they hooked it up and drug it across to the South Dakota side to get the water drained out. And then they, some guy swam back and threw the plug back in it, and yeah, got the boat out of the water. <laughs> Man, but that was a little freaky. The only thing I've done with scuba is mm. with uh, starbase class. Oh yeah, um, and so I got to put the gear on. And just going to the bottom of a pool. Yeah. You know. I think Jackie tried that or did that. Yeah, I didn't like it. Yeah, it's okay. different. A, a pool was okay. Sure. Because I knew I was like right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, what what went, describe some of the training you had and, and uh, goods and bads and yeah, training what, what you in, felt with that. 
training is pretty intense because um, they always try to put you through the most difficult situation. So, like, if you happen to be underwater and, let's say, a boat doesn't know you there, you're there and comes by with its propellers and churns everything up, uh, how you're going to handle it. So in training, what they would do is there was times when you were by yourself as an individual and there was time when you were with a buddy, but the instructors would be up top with uh, snorkels and they would sw swim down. And the first thing they would do is pull your regular out of your mouth so you couldn't breathe. Yep. And then they would tie it to your air tank. And then a lot of times they would um, take your mask off so you couldn't see. They'd try to steal your tanks, take your fins off, just basically beat you up underwater. And the whole time you're holding your breath. Uh, not so bad if you got a breath right before they took your regular out of your mouth, but if not, it could be a struggle. Uh, so as soon as they left, you know, you could see them leave. You would take your tanks off and turn your air back on and try to get a breath and then pull everything away from you. And now remember, you can't see because you don't have your mask. So you're trying to untie your regulator that's tied to your tank and find everything. A lot of times if you were with your buddy still, you could get his regulator and buddy breathe for a while so you mm -hmm. could at least uh, get some air. But that was probably the worst part of training. And that was in a swimming pool, luckily. It wasn't like out in the water. Wow. But yeah, that was... Um, I did not enjoy that part. <laughs> I suppose not. Right, yeah. Man alive. How about when, uh, well, with the rest of the, how, how deep did you end up going? And, you know, to like you're saying, when you you swam under the sub and you're looking up. Sure. I mean. So as a, I was only qualified to go down to about 110 feet. And the deeper you go, the the less time you can spend down there. Right. Um, so 110 feet was as far as we could go. The... Um, the depth of the submarine, um, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but uh, even at the surface, it was still down about 60 feet. So we were down about 40 or 50 feet underneath that looking up at it. Mm -hmm. But the, like I said, the deeper you went, the less time you could spend down there. So Right. Yeah. So if you're at the top and you just start swimming down, how long does it take you to get to that 100, 110 feet? Um, that would depend on if um, how much air you had in your vest or anything. Um, we never really tried to go that deep that fast. Um, a lot of times we were just swimming around the submarine, taking our time to look at stuff. So very seldom did we actually go to 110. Yeah, I kind yeah. of figured that was just an yeah. occasion thing. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had you ever thought about trying any of that scuba stuff? Mm -hmm. or? So when we lived in Hawaii, what was really cool, they'd go night diving and they'd um, get lobster. Yeah. And so then I got to enjoy that. Yeah. That was the closest I got to. There you go. Snorkeling? Um, Hanama I'm, Bay? I, you know, I just like to walk around and look. Because <laughs> I tried the beginning course where you went in the pool, but once they put the oxygen on, I just couldn't relax to allow the tank <laughs> yeah. to breathe. Yeah, For taking me? my first breaths in, you know, when I'm right here, okay, that's yeah. fine. Then you put your head down farther and yeah. you just keep breathing, and it, it's a weird feeling. Right. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. I I wouldn't uh, have the fortitude to go through that training, and and I listen to a lot of podcasts, and a lot of them, some of them are you know Navy SEAL guys and stuff, and to hear some of the stuff they oh, go through, oh yeah. my word, I'm nothing compared to that. Yeah. I we had uh, a bunch of friends come visit us uh, when we lived in Hawaii, and we would take them. Um, scuba diving at night um, to get lobsters and, and stuff and they, they always enjoyed that but it's one thing to be under the water when it's dark because you had a flashlight but it's another thing to be at the surface because um, I mean you've seen Jaws it's yeah you're <laughs> right there and you're just bobbing mm -hmm. uh, so it was a lot easier to be under the water but that was kind of fun to catch lobster and take them back and yeah have a little supper What's, uh, have you have you had any, like, barracuda or any other semi-dangerous um, animals come swimming past you? Or? No. I mean, we saw barracuda in Puerto Rico, but never while we were scuba diving. Mm -hmm. um, turtles, but I actually only saw one shark, and that's when we were pulling into Hawaii, and I was topside on the submarine, so mm -hmm. never really had any bad experiences, thank goodness. Wow. Yeah. How long did you stay certified then? Um, we had, you had to dive like once every 30 days to receive dive pay. 
So when we got to Hawaii, we actually hooked up with the Pearl Harbor dive team and we would go dive with them just to keep certified and keep our dive pay coming. But after a while, it kind of got hard to do that. So we just kind of let it slide. And So going into civilian life, you just... No, I kept all my stuff and um, I didn't realize there was scuba diving in South Dakota, but I guess there's people that go, um, what are some of the, like Fort Randall? Yeah, they'll go fishing. Um, yeah, Chris Portis, and I believe... Oh, yeah, uh, Portis is doing it. Yep. Um, Doc Sarda. Okay. Yeah, and uh, he lives, you know, up in Pierce, so he was telling me how uh, he would uh, get off work, and he'd uh, take his stuff, and I think the river had a bend around sure. there. They lived down here, so he'd walk upstream, and he'd go through, and he'd get maybe, hopefully, his limit on spearing walleyes, nice. and he'd get out of the water here and hand them to the boys, say, <laughs> start get, cleaning supper tonight, and... I guess I That's thought everything cool. looked like the Missouri River down in Yankton. I didn't realize the water was clearer up there, but yeah, they can say they say they can see them. But yeah, I sold everything. I think I might have a flashlight left, but everything's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, snorkeling. I I could handle that. Now my first time was in Hanama Bay. That was yeah. really cool. You know, there's eels and yep. stuff in there, and and uh, some deeper water and some shallower water. Um, but uh, I did do it once down the Florida Keys. Okay. Uh, but they took us out a ways, out to this, out to this spot. And uh, you know, I thought I was feeling pretty comfortable with it, but there was some pretty good current. Oh yeah. On that one. Mm. And then, of course, right before you get in, they're like, "Okay, don't let the current. It's going right there." <laughs> and oh, by the way, don't let the current take you right there because we can't come get you yeah. from that spot. And uh, I didn't. I didn't use a little blow up vest at Hanama Bay or anything, sure. but I did down in, in Florida there. And I mean, I used it yeah. I, yeah. for that buoyancy, but I was just so paranoid of getting swept down there. I didn't mm-hmm. really enjoy it. Um, did you? You might not have been in the unit when we went to Curacao. No, on the drug interdiction meet. Um, I don't believe so. Yeah. So uh, a bunch of us took a. It was like a hundred and twenty foot sailboat deal, and they took us to this other island. Then they anchored off. And then we got to nice. got to snorkel there, but you couldn't see. I mean, it's really clear, but they didn't have near as many things to look at as what Hanama Bay. Sure, yeah, Hanama I, Bay's got everything. I figured the first time I scuba dived, I was in about probably one of the best, best places spots. ever. So, and then a little bit in Guam, but I didn't have much chance to do it. They have a place um, in Hawaii that's kind of a, a lot of beginner scuba divers go. It's called Electric Beach, and the reason they call it that is because there's a power plant on land that um, sucks in water, cools it, but then flushes it back out into the ocean. Kind of the same thing you were just talking about. You could swim out to it, and it was a huge pipe, uh, but you did not want to get in front of that pipe because (laughs) you'd be in the middle of the ocean before you know it. Oh, my word. It was just a discharge pipe that was very, very large, but you could get right up to it as close as you could and see all that water coming out, but you didn't want to get in front of it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no thanks. Yeah, during water survival training, uh, before the hurricane hit Homestead down there, uh, they had this, uh, we had the, this big line where you you would practice your checklist, like coming down on a parachute before you hit the water. Sure. But so we had this big, long zip line, and then we would have to do all of our checklists before hitting the water down there. But it's full of these little jellyfish things down there. I, I don't mm. know if they're actually the stinging ones or not, but... They always uh, talked about how warm the water was, and then they pointed at the nuclear power plant right over there and says, all that warm water? It's coming from coming there. Coming from yeah. there. We're like, oh, yeah, but yeah. these things glow at night, too, those Probably. little fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was, that was something. That was something. So you did a lot of travel. I saw the, uh, the Tower of Pisa, the Eiffel Tower. What are, what are some of the travels that you got to do uh, when you had some time away from the water? Yeah, so I think we had we were in Toulon, France, and um, we were supposed to do like a um, three week exercise with the French, and for some reason they canceled, and we didn't have anything going on. Um, so I talked to you know my commander and myself and three other buddies. We just um, went to Paris and we went to the Louvre and saw the Mona Lisa and the Leaning, or yeah, and then we saw the Eiffel Tower. And then went to uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and yeah, I mean that was a great, 
time because it was just four of us and got to see and do a lot. And then, like I said, when Jackie flew over to Rome in 91, 92, we went to the Colosseum and got to see the Pope. So mm-hmm. that, that was very neat. Um, you get a, your wallet stolen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> great. Yeah, the gypsy kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You had to watch them. But then another buddy, we got on a train and went up to Switzerland uh, for a couple days. That was a pretty good trip. But, you know, typical military, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's got to go and see and do and enjoy mm-hmm. all this stuff. So Well, and I grew up just uh, an hour south of Sioux Falls, and you talked about, you know, being in Nebraska. But getting to go see things sure uh, is huge. Uh, there's yeah. so many people around here uh, – some of them haven't been outside the five-state region Amen. much or, you know, flown to, you know, I think everybody needs to get to D.C., Sure, you know, to see the museums and all yeah. the stuff that's out there. And, I agree. You know, at least once. So uh, we got to travel, but I love being able to buy an acreage and do the traveling but come home, and that's mm-hmm. why I only spent two and a half years active duty, mm-hmm. uh, went into the guard so that you could buy a home and, and, and keep it. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 So the place you have in Lennox, is that the first place you bought when you uh, got into the guard here? Um, so we lived in Brandon in an apartment for a year, a two years, and then actually just saw an ad in the paper for an acreage and called the gentleman and, yeah, ended up buying uh, just about 27 acres not too far from you, Jim. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, we've been there since 2020, or excuse me, 2000. 2000. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. been 20, March 1st was 24 years because we moved in on March 1st. So, mm-hmm. yeah. How many kids have you raised there? Uh, three. We have uh, April is married and living in Florida, Port Orange. Uh, she married a gentleman named uh, Jaron, and he was an Army Ranger uh, from Rapid City area. And then Jacob, um, he lives on, down in, on Phillips Avenue, and uh, Abby is currently living in St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, three great kids and all Lennox graduates. How long have you been empty nesters? Just a year and a half. Yeah, year and a half. Abby hasn't been gone. That She's only 19. Mm-hmm. So I guess she'll be 20 here shortly, but mm-hmm. almost two years, maybe two years. Yeah, an adjustment? For one or either of you or both? I think we're both. So we both have two jobs. Uh, we stay pretty busy. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to Landscape Garden Centers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, I think uh, we see each other at nights when we get home. And then uh, Jackie works Saturdays at her second job. Um, but, yeah, we... We try to spend as much time as we can. It's just, it's still busy. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like retirement. You find that out. But, you know, I have the soft starts in the morning, so that usually kills two, three hours. But, (laughs) um, you know, there's still so much to be done. Yeah. (laughs) Well, most of the retirees I've talked to, they're like, I don't know how I had time to work, you know. (laughs) Right. But uh, You can always find something to do. Yeah. Well, you're not one to, not one to sit around. No. At all. No. Not at all. Get restless. <laughs> uh, I was looking at some generic questions I have here, and one of them was, what made you the most proud of being in uniform? And what that reminded me of is how many flags you folded, how many flags oh. you pres- presented. How did you get into that? Just explain what I'm talking about. So, sure. Um, I'm a current member of the South Dakota Honor Guard, where we do... Um, funerals for military veterans. Um, I guess uh, Tim Wenzel got me into that. Um, I'm not really sure how it all came to be. I remember working with Jeff Nelson, Lisa Eisenhower, Tom Dummermuth, Theron Legans. Mm-hmm. Um, I could go on and on and on, but I, I would have to say Tim, um, him and I probably did the most funerals together. And um, a lot of people say they could never do it. And I understand that. And you kind of just have to, it's, it's never easy, but it's a lot easier when you don't know the, the, the person, right. uh, the struggles are when you do know them, when they were a friend or a past supervisor, or, you know, just, um, probably 
the the hardest one, a couple of the hardest ones I've ever had to do are suicides from young people. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one in particular standing over the gravesite, and then the young man was 18, 19 years old. And I just thought, um, yeah, it's not easy. But I had a son mm -hmm. who was the same age. Right. And I'm like, this young person is done, and he's going to go six feet under forever. And I, I don't understand that, but, yeah. Yeah, and we've had some time, some, uh, it's hit our unit, mm -hmm. you know, as, as well. And, um, yeah, and you were telling me about another time, you were probably going to get to it, but if we if things go schedule, the podcast just prior to yours is Deb Phelps. Sure, yeah. And, uh you had mentioned, well, that you had worked in her area for yes. a while. And uh, she did mention that she had lost her husband. So yes, you were describing that a little bit too. And right. And tough. It, that's another tough one because I knew Harlan. Um, I worked with him when I was in supply, CSL, and uh, delivering parts and got to know him. And then obviously Deb was one of my first supervisors in the Air Guard um, in supply. Um, I knew her family because they were from T. Uh, so not too far away from Lennox. Um, so those are never easy. Uh, another very tough one was um, Lori Tiedemann. Yes. Uh, I wasn't you know, able to attend that one. Sure. I wanted to. Um, there was not room in that church. Like when we folded the flag, I almost hit the guy in the nose when we uh, unfolded the flag. But obviously I've worked with Lisa and um, Eric, and I've met their dad. Um, before so that was uh that was a tough one also mm -hmm. so some are easier than others for sure but mm, always yeah. tough yeah and uh i had lost a buddy actually the i think it was the second podcast i brought broadcast we had filmed it uh shortly after the the doing father son yeah fighter pilot one in this back room here um but i lost a, a friend from heart attack and he was way up at northern alaska uh, mm. when that happened mm. and uh i had two things on that deal because uh, i flew up there and we had an open casket deal up there uh, and then we had him cremated and we brought him home right when covid was starting well i'll tell you this four years ago today is when he passed i just realized oh, that. wow yeah oh. Yeah, so it was uh, just a couple of days after that that I that I went up there, um, and I'm in full uniform, and uh, I'm standing at the back of and and his wife just did a fantastic job holding it together, speaking, standing right up there by him and stuff, you know, and and I just felt like I was like guarding the place back there, and he had a lot of Air Force buddies that came in and out, and I was going to go up and say some words. I couldn't hardly do it. Right. I went up there and I got some things out, but it, it's so hard. It's tough. Just, just really hard. Uh, and then we went to uh, fold the flag and me and one of his Air Force buddies, um, and um, I really screwed it up because <laughs> <laughs> it was like, uh, it was like, okay, well, I'll take the blue side because I was like, I didn't want to be folding it here and then misstep and sure. have it come out of my hand so yeah. yeah i'll stand on the blue side well you're kind of leading on the color fold yeah you're not supposed to have <laughs> red and white on the outside right so we had to <laughs> we had to redo that we practice a lot <laughs> yeah yeah you guys are uh, very good in particular on that and the you know the, the extra creases and checking and yeah yep. it's, it's just uh no matter who's doing it it just uh and i was just at one with military honors um uh, Actually, two of them in the last uh, week and a half. Okay. And uh, but uh, one was already folded because he was cremated and stuff. Sure. But they did folding, and I thought of you and uh, Tim and those guys that uh, really meticulously take yeah. care of that for the family. That's very commendable. That's we got some great cool. members on the team right now that mm -hmm. are um, always uh, ready to step up and and uh, apply their knowledge to the funerals and mm -hmm. about so. Right, right. It's a little happier uh, subject here. You've talked about two jobs, this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. And you 
have made some fantastic videos. Oh. <laughs> the bike trips. Sure. Was yeah, well, there was maybe one bike picture in here. And when you said when I was gonna get some pictures from you, I expected like tons of bike <laughs> pictures. But I could have got them off Facebook they, they, myself, yeah. which I could still do some of that. But uh, explain some of that uh, off time and your planning and uh, the the is it has it been two long ones so far? Yeah, one uh, sort of kind of three, um, but really two big ones. So I guess it probably started. Uh, South Dakota has a bike ride. They used to have a bike ride called the Tour Dakota. I think now it's called the um, RASDAC, the ride across South Dakota. But <clears throat> we were on a ride, and I believe it was me and Jackie and maybe my brother down in Nebraska. It was called Bran, the bicycle ride across Nebraska. Okay. And we were just going down the road, and I looked off to my right, and there was a guy on a mountain bike riding, not in the ditch, but like on the side of the ditch. And I'm like, what is he doing? And someone's like, oh, he's on the, um, the cowboy trail. And I'm like, what the hell is a cowboy trail? Well, it turns out the cowboy trail is a lot like the Mickelson trail in South Dakota. It's an old railroad, railroad line. Um, and it runs from Norfolk actually all the way out to Shadron, but it's pretty much kept up only to Valentine. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that sounds pretty neat. So a couple years later, I borrowed a friend's, uh, child carrier, kid carrier, and all behind them. And I threw my sleeping bag and a tent in it and uh, rode down to Nebraska to Norfolk and then jumped on the trail and rode to Valentine and then came across the river and um, came through Parkston and Platt and all of that. Back home, I think I was gone for like seven days. But, um, yeah, a lot of work, but I'm like, this is really neat. Like, I could do this again. The birth yeah, yeah. Of, those, was, of those awesome trips you've right. done. And then, um, I don't know, I kind of look at things that I'm just, I see what other people have done. And I'm like, if they can do it, why can't I do it? And it's really as simple as that. And there are a lot of people that do these trips. Um, so, yeah, saved some money and bought a, got, bought a pretty good bike and some stuff and um, probably three years ago, I guess, uh, did my first big one from Bellingham, Washington down to Reno, Nevada. That was probably not the smartest idea for my first bike ride. Cause I went through the Sierra Cascade mountain range. What, what month, what time of year? Cause I know you had some issues. Yeah. Um, you were in May. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So May 22nd was the first day of pedaling. And then I finished on June 8th cause that was my birthday. Mm-hmm. And, um, wow. but yeah, there was snow, uh, the one thing that really sticks out is uh, a lot of mountains. And then one day I camped and I knew that I had to get up early cause the next day was going to be kind of tough. I was going past Mount St. Helens. So I got up and started pedaling, and I don't know, I'd probably been going for two hours or so, and uh, pulled over to the side of the road because I had my raincoat on, and I was taking it off, and a Ford F-350 from Texas pulls up beside me, and they were coming from the other direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they said, like, what are you doing? Where are you going? I said, well, I'm going up over the road, like, where you just came from. And they said, on this road? And I'm like, yeah, it's the only road here. <laughs> They're like, well, we have this truck, and um, we went as far as we could in the snow till we got high centered, and then we had to turn around. <clears throat> and so I asked them, I said, could you see the other side? And they're like, no. Yeah. And they said, well, you could leave your trailer and take your bike to the other side, and come back and get your trailer. And I'm like, well, my trailer probably weighs 50 to 60 pounds, and it has everything. Like, I can't just leave it. No. Uh, so I had to turn around. And uh, rely on Google Maps to get me where I was going. Um, but I finally figured out that I had to get back on my on the original trail. Uh, so I punched it in, and I basically just said, get me to Crater Lake, because that, that would have got me on my trail. Well, it took me off on a forest service road, which was fairly decent because it was two-lane paved. And then it turned into two lanes um, gravel, and then it turned into one-lane gravel. Um, slept on the side of the road, um, in the snow 
hadn't seen a car or a person for 20 hours. And uh, probably the only time I really ever got worried about bears. But actually, the mosquitoes were eating me alive, which yeah. is so weird because there was snow. Huh. But the next morning, I woke up at 7, got an early start, ended up pushing my bike through um, four and a half miles of snow until I got out of it. And, then and not, knowing not knowing when you're going to get out exactly. of it. Exactly. Oh, and man. praying that my battery didn't die because I had no reception out there. You know, it was just going off of what it was. <laughs> And I had no idea where I was. And she has no clue of yeah, the she, dire straits you're no, getting no, into. No, because I couldn't and, contact anybody or anything. But uh, it was a trip, but maybe I should have picked an easier one first. So what was scarier, that or getting beat up during scuba training while you're underwater? <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably wouldn't have killed me on the scuba training, but uh, the bike ride could have gone south pretty fast. So Wow. What year was that? Uh, so I turned 51, so... 53 now mm -hmm. was i 51 yeah um so no yeah two and a half years ago so it only took you another year or so later to do another yeah long trip yeah and this one was a lot the same because i went through bellingham but i started in vancouver canada but i stuck to the coast this time so uh a lot less hills and a lot more people the yeah. first time i did it i only saw two people who were doing the same thing i was but this time I ran into people from the Netherlands, from Germany, from Vermont. There was a lot more people. Mm -hmm. And that's always fun because you get to talk story and hear what everybody's up to and you can help each other out. I had a really bad issue with my back tire and some guy from um, Ohio had an extra um, tube that he gave me. And basically, because I was pumping up my tire like every two miles, mm. and that makes for a long day. Sure does. So he gave me a tube, and uh, everything went better after that. But it's, uh, I've had friends that say, you're crazy. I could do what you do in a car, but it's not the same. <laughs> when you go 80, you don't experience things when you go 10. Right. Um, and you don't, nobody cares when you're in a car. You're just another tourist. Yep. But um, everybody wants to know your story, like what's your wife think and how many miles did you go and where are you from and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's totally different. Yeah, through the years, we've had a few people go through yeah, here. Yeah, I've seen them. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, uh, well, Nancy and Jeff, um, the Good Earth Farm, they're actually um, sponsors of like a campsite that's on the website. So if you are pedaling through or hiking through, you can stay at their place. Um, I forget, Warm Showers, I believe is the name okay. of it. But. Kind of like boondocking yes. with uh, campers. They all register. Yep, same that. kind of deal. So have you thought about doing any bike trips with them? You know, just a very small thing or anything? Not much into the... I, well, I did the Tour to Coda, yep. the mm -hmm. brand. Yep. And, you know, the first time he did that, I thought, oh, my gosh, to be on your bike for 50 to 100 miles a day, that's crazy. And then... Then I did it. I'm like, okay, I'm all about the pie. <laughs> <laughs> she loves the pie. Got to stop at places. And chit-chatting with people. And we found out we could never ride together mm -hmm. because he just wants to get to the next town. And I just want to get to know people <laughs> and find out where. Jackie where has one speed. And it's the speed she starts out at is the same speed she finishes. Yep. And I always give her a hard time because I'm like, don't you ever get warmed up and want to go faster? And she's like, no, I'm good. I'm good. So we just have an agreement. I'll meet you at home usually if we ride together. <laughs> little tortoise in the hair yeah. thing going on <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> Has she ever beat you home because you get distracted? Silly. No, Never. Silly. <laughs> so then I became the SAG driver. Yeah. So I just let him do the riding, and then I go to the next town and set up camp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I have no interest in doing these long trips mm -hmm. they're mm -mm. pretty adventurous to do that oh i you guess yeah. but you're living life you're not sitting sitting back you know it's funny because i don't necessarily look at it like that um i suppose you can but i'm just like you said i'm just living life i mean mm -hmm. i'm just riding a bike that's all i'm doing yeah meeting people and yeah i mean i've I don't think I've ever put myself in danger. I'm not always sleeping in a tent. I will. The motel feels pretty good some nights yeah. when you need a shower or, 
yeah, your tent soaking wet, but. Well, and a lot of that, and you mentioned wildlife. I was going to mention it too, but so a lot of your campsites when you're in the mountainous area, you put food cache like up in trees or did, did you have like a sealed trailer that you put your food in? No, nothing. Uh, the one time I was off the forest service road, I had, you know, them tuna packets. So I <laughs> ate it, but then I walked like a half mile to bury it or get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not so, um, knowledgeable on that stuff. So I probably could have got myself in trouble, but I've, yeah, normally I'm in a city park or a national park or a state park. I'm not literally camping on the side of the road. That was a right. one-time one kind of unfortunate deal, but hopefully it doesn't happen again. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you made a really cool video. I, I don't remember maybe it was if it was your first trip, um, but some of the, the scenery and stuff was just amazing. But I don't know if you had some captions on there or what, but uh, – some of the trials and tribulations there, and I was like, oh, my word. One of the – I think that was the first one. Uh, the one thing I do remember, um, I was I came into a small town, and they had a campsite. <clears throat> so I pulled in. I was going to pay to get a spot to set up the tent. Well, I went to the camp host, and they had a sign out front that said, um, you know, off Wednesday and Thursday. If it's after – um, four o'clock call this number so I called the number well it was the city hall but nobody answered so I was kind of in a spot I didn't know what to do and I'm like if I set up in a campsite and somebody shows up at midnight then I got to move mm -hmm. so I kind of just set up in the bushes like a little hidden spot sure um, put all my stuff in the trees and everything was good I had no issues but I went to bed that night sound asleep and uh, all of a sudden, this is what's going on in my head. I'm thinking that the ladies, the camp host ladies, have found me, and they're spraying my tent with a garden hose, telling me to get out. Really? That's what's happening in my head. Uh -huh. Not realizing that I had set my tent up on an underground sprinkler <laughs> that was spraying my tent. Uh, but, you know, when it's midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning, and you're very, very tired, and you're camping where you're not supposed to be, uh, but it went off and then came back on like 15 minutes later and then never came back on the rest of the night. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was an experience. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I suppose, uh, and you bought a little bit of gear to do that, but you don't buy too much cause you don't want too much weight. No. And again, the first time was kind of bad because, um, I did not pack, um, enough food or water. I actually ran out of both. I was drinking water off a snow melt off the side of a mountain. I remember that part. Yeah. And, and then, that's what got me, the short on water. Yeah, bad mistake. Mm -hmm. And then I ran out of food, too, because I was going over Rainy Pass, and I forget the other pass, but I just ran out of food. Basically hadn't eaten all day, and I ran into three backcountry skiers, and um, they had leftover salmon and hamburger stew from the night before, an IPA, and some goo, which is uh, like an energy stuff, but it was the best sandwich I'd ever had in my life. Oh, I can imagine. And they were extremely friendly, but that got me through the day, at least to the next town. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you learn something every time you do it, you know. Yeah, I remember going through our uh, POW training that, that we did in our career field, you know, to help the survival instructors. And we went through the same survival school the pilots did. And, and uh, wow, when you were without much food at all for yeah. multiple days, uh, I remember uh, we had to link up with uh, the partisan group to help, like the Underground Railroad, to help you get out. Um, but they served us uh, some rice and a little bit of uh, corned beef. <clears throat> and we had these uh, canteen cups, you know, and they put about that much in there. And I'm looking at that like, dude, right, come fill on. it up. I couldn't finish it, you know, because your stomach shrunk oh, so much. Yeah. And, oh. and you just, and you're supposed to eat slow, of course, you know, and stuff. Yep. And you think you're just going to pound down all this food. And uh, actually, I wish I had a little bit of that right now. I need to shrink my stomach and eat a little less. Send you back to training. Yeah, I've, uh, I've gained a little more since I've been retired a little over three years, you know. And I'm at a certain number that you, I do not want to pass. So I want to. You could still pass that PT test. But, <laughs> <laughs> probably not with an excellent. I probably have to do, do one during COVID. Sure. <laughs> not like what happened, but. 
Yeah, that actually felt pretty good not having to walk out to your last PT test. And, I mean, it's got to feel good doing that too, but yeah. Someday. Things are just nuts Yeah, during yeah. that. So I retired uh, November of 2020, so I was, only, I was about like halfway into the – Sure. The pain that sure. everybody was feeling on that. But it made for an interesting time, you know, your last, you know, six, eight months uh, in the military, in the guard. It was it was just different. You quiet. Because yeah. we, we split Split up. shifts, yeah. Yeah. Except the, the music wasn't quiet coming out of my uh, out of my office. I think, I think we you were, were on my shift, I think. You still had the music. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was, that was something else. That was uh, that was some trying times. Hopefully, we won't go through something like that again. I agree. All right, pictures. What else did we have here? F sixteen ride. Sure. Tell us about that. Um, so I at the time I worked at the post office, and I heard about the um, promotion. I guess whatever you want to call it to get two people to enlist mm -hmm. within a year's time, and uh, Mike Driscoll who um, came from finance and then went into training, and then Brian Eastman, who was in uh, finance the entire time, I believe. But they both worked, worked with me at the post office, ex, both ex-Marines. And so, yeah, I got a ride, got them to enlist, and um, Eric Knutson Nuts was my pilot. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe I said it was 2002, I think. So, yeah, that was another great experience. Uh, pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just saw nuts the other night. Right, he uh, was at Remedy. Yeah, you were there. Right, that's yes. right. Yeah, that was one of the two times we've seen each other in the last <laughs> month, and we haven't really had a chance to talk. First one was in here for the wild game feed. It was a little loud both nights. But <laughs> both nights. Yeah. yeah, I should have got over and talked to nuts. I didn't have the chance to, mm -hmm. but that was nice. He showed up. Yeah, yeah. Because that was also IKEA's retirement. Right. Same night. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that F sixteen. That's quite quite the deal especially takeoff because they send her straight up in the air and you're like hold on here we go yeah and your your flight was here in sioux falls correct yep. okay because yep. uh in uh tucson when we were down there at times we would do a lottery and and do rides down there so nice. i wasn't sure if you were on one of those nope that was back here so mm -hmm. you can see it was a long time ago because the kids were pretty mm -hmm. pretty little mm. kids an absolutely tremendous hurdler, if I remember right. Let's talk about that. Jacob? Yeah. yeah. He did okay. <laughs> Maybe she better tell a story. Sure, I'll let her. She's, <laughs> she's been pretty quiet. I'll let her chat. I'm going to actually stand up. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, you can. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> that chair can get hard on the, well, I on much, the guy. I ain't much of a sitter anyway, so this will be fine. Mm -hmm. I'll pull this up for you just a little bit. Perfect. There you go. You're up. Oh, okay. So, yeah, our son had an opportunity to run um, two years at Northern and then finish three years strong at SDSU. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, quite an accomplishment. His grandpa was a hurdler. His dad hurdled and um, His uncle. uncle. Aunt. Becky. Really? She hurdled? I think so. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's neat to um, see him be able to do it in the college realm. Mm -hmm. It's but a I lot of fun. I think what um, was really uh, unique is in high school, in Lennox, he would win every 110, and his yeah. buddy Nick Kale would come in second. And then in the 300. Same down. Same town, okay. Lennox, yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and then in the 300s, Nick would win first, and then Jacob would come in second. And that's exactly how they ended up in state. Mm -hmm. First and second, first and second. So wow. that was that was pretty neat, considering they were teammates and supported each other all the way through. Yeah, because I think that's when I learned about him was uh, the high school stuff, because you maybe had posted something. Probably and a few and how tall was he? Not very tall. No. Is he shorter than you? No, he's... <clears throat> Shorter than me? No. No. He's a little taller than you. Yeah, maybe an taller. inch, maybe yeah. a half inch, yeah. Okay. He'd be the one that knocked down all, he knocks down all the hurdles, but. But he had some hops on him. He could dunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he could, <clears throat> the, 
he did well in high school, but in college, I think they raised him three inches, I believe. So he would he would hit a lot. And he said, Dad, I just power through him. I'm like, whatever you hit, it's going to slow you down. I don't think he ever quite understood that. But <laughs> but he must have did you know pretty good because he um, tied for fifth place in uh, at SDSU. So he's on the on the board on the board. Yeah. Nice. He did pretty well. They used to have. The 165 lows. Do you, do you remember? Have you ever heard of that? I don't know if my dad maybe did those back yeah. in the day, but well, I my my brother had sprinting record. He had the 100 meter record for quite a while. I grew up in Elk Point down okay. there, and uh, you know how you're you can be in a sibling shadow a little bit. You sure. know, I wasn't quite as fast as as him, so I I tried the hurdles. Never been flexible. Couldn't do the. <laughs> Hurdler stretch properly, not right. even close. But it was a fun race. Yeah. But uh and I couldn't alternate lead feet, so couldn't hardly get the three step. Yeah. A lot of fives speed in between <laughs> and whoop, you know, hopping in between. Yeah. No no skimming the nickels off the sure. top like it sounds like your son was trying to do, but sure. just a little lower. Yeah. Um but it, it's a fun race. It but, is. Uh, it's yeah. it can be a grueling one, but the um and I remember my very first one. I don't know if my coach knew it or, or what, but I went to my very first meet. It was at USD. I met a guy from Beersford over here. Uh, and I went up when we we're going to start warming up, and I stood next to the hurdle. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's <laughs> yeah, lower yeah, I've been I had been practicing on the intermediates, uh, and they're actually supposed to be three inches higher. First time ever doing it in front of a crowd of people. <laughs> Oh, that was that was nuts. <laughs> Not but the one sixty five lows were great. Could you imagine that race? One sixty five lows. I could handle that. Absolutely yeah. a blast. Especially the shorter you are, the mm-hmm. better it's gotta be. Yep. But then uh after my sophomore year I think they they nixed that mm-hmm. and then they went to the three hundred intermer- intermediates, which is just a grueling race. Oh. I hated it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never did those in high school, but mm-hmm. I had a lot of friends that did, and then Jacob, of course. But that's a long ways to go over hurdles. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. So I've kind of gone through the the pictures. There was something that looked like ancient ruins, but was that like the Rome, the Rome thing? Did like a Colosseum kind that of thing? That was probably the Colosseum. Yeah. Okay. Could have been. Was it just me in the picture, or was it Jackie and I? Uh. Th- I think it might have been both of you. Okay, that's probably the Colosseum in Rome then. Mm-hmm. Oh, a camel ride. Oh, yeah, that was in Turkey. Yeah. Like 96? Oh. Well, we went 96 and I think 2002. Yeah, so I would have been on the submarine from uh, like 90 to 94, give or take, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. So it had to be in that time frame. But what I thought was kind of interesting about that picture is April, my oldest, um, she was in the um, Minnesota unit and then deployed with them uh, in 2017, 2018, mm-hmm. and got to go over there and ride a camel. So I always kind of wanted to put those two pictures together. I thought that was kind of neat. So, yeah. yeah. Long time ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how often, uh, back to the submarine thing, how often... Would the skipper or whatever, I'm sorry, I don't mean no, to be uh, disrespectful, no. that they would let you do the swimming thing, you know, get out and get some sun. and Not very often. In four years of on the submarine, we probably did it three times. Oh, me. my word. Yeah, quite honestly. But it was never, people think you're just stuck down there. The longest time we were ever like underneath the water was 33 days. But we spent a lot of time in port, mm-hmm. like... We spent a lot of time in Toulon, France, and then La Madalena, Italy, and you know we went to Greece, and we'd pull in a lot of places, and uh, Rock of Gibraltar, we'd we'd go there. So it wasn't all bad. Like people would go crazy if they were under oh, the water for that long. Yeah, you would really think so. You'd get on each other's nerves. So, mm-hmm. but only so many swim calls. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kind of bring up a sad thing. I think we we lost a guard member scuba diving. Um, I don't know if it's been eight years ago now. Scott Midland. I don't know if you ever met Scott Midland. Yes. He was in part time in QA for a while and some yep. others. I think he had 
I do remember that. Away. I do remember. I don't remember the the details of that, but I do remember the name, and I remember people talking about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, at Retirees Coffee, uh, once a year, uh, they will read the names of oh. everybody that passed, so they keep up that. That's and, nice. And it, it's a it's a long list, and and that usually is some of the the larger. Uh, we get, we get a pretty good showing at retirees coffees once a month, second Tuesdays, uh, try to get somebody from the base or two to come, come and speak. speak. Sure. But with the, with the reading of, of the names, uh, you usually get a big crowd there. And, and I think they've changed it to where when they start, they read the names of the ones that just passed that year. Uh, so they're not just all mixed in with right. the rest, but you know, we all, we all sit there and, and, and listen and you just hear the names of, People you know, right. you, you haven't forgotten them, but you know you just don't, you know, just don't think of all those people yeah. every day. And right, do you guys meet at the Alliance now? Yes, or, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. There's uh, there's some of the guys that you know wish we could get back on base and and do it. Uh, I understand that, um, and it's also nice to visit the shops, um, but you know the ops tempo now too. Right, you know it, it's it is busier than what it was 20 years ago, and yeah, and. Uh, you know, we can't bother people in the shops much, but uh, I, I myself like the Alliance just overall. Right. Well, uh, it's a very re- nice establishment, so. Yeah, I had my retirement there. Yeah. And, uh, when I interviewed uh, Larry Tenniger, uh, I don't know if you'll get a chance to see his. His is a two-part one. Uh, he was uh, um, a Vietnam combat medic and then got in the reserves later. He was also a a uh, professor at USD for a while, oh, wow. has multiple powerlifting records. He was born in 1950 at two pounds, Jeez. got sick and was a pound and three quarter, uh, fought back, uh, ended up doing three tours in Iraq because uh, he heard that the, the Navy needed uh, uh, the corpsman. Yeah. And so an amazing story, but uh, he just got kind of a gray background behind him. We're in the Alliance okay. for that. Okay. Uh, uh, talk to uh, Rachel Van Der Zee and yeah. see if we, because in, in here, the hog house, it's pretty nice this time of year and stuff, but in the summertime, might be some flies around and, <laughs> and all that. Swat and flies, no. So, but yeah, we filmed Larry's uh, in the Alliance there. That's nice. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, he, he has, he's got quite a story there. And, Did you just recently do that? We, uh, we started putting these out the uh, middle of June 23, uh, so that was end of the end of summer. Okay. Last I feel like I just that saw one that. that you recently did, but maybe it was somebody else. Um, at the Alliance, you're saying? No, or? just um, I feel like who you're describing is what I just saw, but mm. it could have been somebody else. Yeah, and and what I'm doing is there's uh, some of the podcasts I'm making some shorts now, or some oh. not really the the reels, but just a shorter clips. Yeah, I guess is what I'd call it. So. But yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we've um, enjoyed it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna I was, I was gonna look at Jackie over and say, so what what mm-hmm. have not what have, what have we not touched on? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think. You're pro- well, I always think, you know, he goes on all these beautiful trips and it really takes a wife who supports him. Exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say that. And very patient. <laughs> right? Exactly. But I think the military definitely um, shapes you mm-hmm. as a spouse um, to be very forgiving and understanding that, yep, go do. I've done all these deployments by myself with three kids. What's another month or two months gone nine months <laughs> oops yeah yeah especially when you're thinking about this new upcoming trip sure yes the four monther <coughs> nine. what whoa we gotta hear this nine months it's not gonna take nine months maybe see ya <laughs> where am i gonna go she can come for part of it right no i'd rather just Stay on a beach somewhere. Go back to Hawaii. <laughs> mm-hmm. What I'd like to do is there's a, called the Southern Tier route. It goes from St. Augustine, Florida to San Diego. So that'd be about 3,100 miles. And if I averaged 
Um, 60 miles a day, it would take me 51 days. But <clears throat> part of the problem is when I do these things, I always have a job waiting for me at the end and a plane ticket that I have to get to. Right. Um, so I, stress. Right. So I never have any time. Like, for instance, this last time I stopped at a campsite and there was two guys there. And the one guy's like, hey, welcome. How are you? Like, we just got here. And he's like, how many miles did you do today? And I'm like, I think I did an 86. And he's like, oh, my God. He's like, he's like, today's our zero day. And I'm like, what the hell's a zero day? And he's like, we just didn't ride today. We didn't do nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't have that luxury. Like, I have got to be in San Francisco on this date. Um, so if I could do this when I retire, then I would take longer and enjoy the sights and stay in a town for longer. Um, but anyway, so it goes from St. Augustine to um, San Diego, which would take approximately three months, I figure. And then you've heard of the Appalachian Trail. Mm -hmm. So there's a thing on the West Coast called the PCT, the Pacific Crest Trail. And that <clears throat> starts not very far from San Diego. So what I'd like to do is get to San Diego, ship the bike home, and then pack and start the PCT a week later, and that goes to Canada. So that would take five wow. months on top of the three months. So it could be an eight to nine month. Oh, see, he never told me about that. I, I thought I they were two wondering. separate. Well, they are two like, separate. Two separate times, <laughs> there's not a, there's, all in one year. There's a week separating them. <laughs> we have to talk. So, Oh, man. <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's what I'm looking at next. So he gets very restless, doesn't he? He does. He I was is. looking for the the just right <laughs> sound effect like really? something like that. Yeah, like throw in crazy. There. Stupid. <laughs> yeah. Whether it happens or not, but I got to have a goal, I got to have something to shoot for. Mm -hmm. So Well, part of the deal too, one piece of advice I'd have is uh Wait till you get there for your one-way ticket back. Yes. <laughs> so you don't have that set. Oh, I will. Over for ahead sure. of you. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and if I do it right this time, I won't have a plane ticket in San Diego. I just have to buy a backpack. And then whenever I get to Canada, I'll have to figure that out. But hopefully she'll be there mm. to drive me home. Mm. 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 <laughs> what kind of uh, <laughs> gifts and right, flowers yeah. and... Dinner's planned and all that. Let's we'll make that happen. It's a long ways away. <laughs> we'll have to talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not part of that conversation. No, probably not. <laughs> That's going to mm -mm. be later. Yeah. I just was watching her face this whole <laughs> time, like... you know, the last five minutes. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> for mm -hmm. part of that, I was like, at the beginning, I was like, was he talking about a work trip? Or... <laughs> no. Nope. Because you had mentioned that. A little bit of that trip to me. I don't remember where we were, if it was on the phone when we were talking about doing this. The previous yeah. bike trips or this um, one? No, just I didn't know that it was all together, oh, but just the different either. legs that are on there. So, yeah, so he wasn't telling me anything before he told you. Nope. But, uh, both pretty amazing. <laughs> well, they got to happen first. You can talk about a lot of things, but mm -hmm. they don't matter unless you do them. Yeah, well, you've proven that. Yeah. You've I just figure that. I'm there, so mm -hmm. might as well do it. Well, I don't have to worry about you guys with the old phrase, uh, sitting's the new smoking. So even when you retire, you won't be sitting around. I hope not. I get bored pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. I do love the soft starts in the morning, though. Oh, yeah. Take your time with that. I could handle that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Jackie, we missed anything else? Well, he likes to play with bees. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Do you, do you jar up the honey? You, are I do. you that far into it? How I, long have you been doing that? Well, so my grandfather was actually a beekeeper. That's my mom. That's how they grew up. Mm -hmm. And then um, growing up in Randolph, Nebraska, um, at one time, we, were, we had the most beekeepers per capita of any other town in America. Mm -hmm. So they labeled themselves as the beekeeping capital of the world. So I worked for a family in high school. Um, Went to Texas, North Dakota with the bees and stuff. And I don't know, I just always found it very interesting. So right now I have um, three hives and um, going to seven this year. Um, and yeah, I do sell honey. So 
um, yeah, I just really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun, and I learn something every year. So I've got some neighbors that do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so always kind of bouncing ideas off them. Josh Mork. Uh, yeah, I did. I did know that he, he yep. does because he moved over to Sioux Center. I got a brother. Yep. Excuse me brother over there yeah so yeah, we're we bounce ideas him. off each other and see how things are going but i don't know just a fun hobby something to do mm -hmm. not real labor intensive then so when you're gone for quite a while you don't have like a ton of chores oh, to do with bees or? i hope not <laughs> <laughs> no because really, he's into it already he's just yeah. gonna get bigger yeah really that's not a lot to do uh -huh. with them so you kind of just leave them alone and let them make the honey and then you just go in and take it so mm -hmm. nice not too bad at all <laughs> yeah, I do enjoy that. What are your hobbies, Jackie? I like to run and um, travel. Mm -hmm. um, yoga. Yep, I love yoga. She's a very good school teacher, second grade school teacher in Parker. Yeah, that's loves a kids. fun job. And then I love spending my time on Phillips Avenue at um, Primp Boutique and help others spend money and look good. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. Do you guys yeah. take advantage of the first Fridays through the summer? We do. Yeah, we try to get downtown. We run into um, Scotty Carpenter and uh, the general, the hippie general, mm -hmm. with a long ponytail, <laughs> Steve Warren. He might be doing one of these with his dad maybe oh, by the end awesome. of the month here. Yeah, we see them down there all the time. I mm -hmm. uh, really enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't, uh, we didn't do much last year, but I want to get back on that yeah. this year. So it's fun. Yeah, we have a nice downtown, don't we? We do. Mm -hmm. We do. And, you know, we've seen them, we've witnessed them where they uh, totally tried shutting the street off, where it was all walked through like outdoor mall, and then that, that yeah, flopped, and work. they put a street back in, and now with what they're building with the whole area and then working north in the park. Uh, oh, yeah. Got a Levitt, really good job. The Levitt and uh, 8th and Railroad area, really nice. Right. Yeah. It's amazing how many people come to Sioux Falls from other cities after they've experienced it. They're like, we had no idea. Yeah. You don't find that in other, other cities. Places, yeah. 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 Getting to be a little more culture in town yeah. too. So I like it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so. Yeah. all right. Well, I think we're, uh, I think we're rolling down on it and, and uh, yeah, I just, uh, I appreciate you guys uh, doing this. I, I just have a blast doing this and you get a chance. Like I said, we've seen you guys at a couple events this last month, but we didn't really get to sit down and talk. I was looking forward to, to doing this and this night kind of came up sure yeah we're gonna wait a little bit longer but yeah it worked out I'm glad well i think we've canceled on you five times so we... oh it's just postponed <laughs> right yeah. no we enjoyed it jim thanks a lot for having us out and you bet definitely mm -hmm. thank you all right take care thanks See for you. watching Mm. She's a little lighter than we are and stuff, though. I mean, I you're, just, you're sitting back farther, too. So I'm just... You're